All right, so today is the actually the last uh, uh, sermon topic in a series that I started several weeks ago called Get Right or Get Out. And if you've been following along, you know that we are going over, uh, and if you would, keep something in Proverbs 23, but go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just kind of as a, as a way of review here. But what we've been talking about uh, with a title like that, Get Right or Get Out, we've been talking about are the sins that the Bible lists that would actually get you kicked out of the local church. And to some, this is, this, is, uh, this is a revelation in and of itself that the Bible actually teaches some people to be kicked out of church. But nothing could be clearer in the Scripture. In fact, if we look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 9, it reads, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, but or with the covetous or extortioners or with the idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. So he's saying, look, you shouldn't be keeping company with any of these people. But then, he's saying, but then he goes on and clarifies and says, but not... We're not speaking of those that are of this world. Otherwise, you'd have to leave the world. If, we were to, if that was the standard that God held us to, to not company or have fellowship with fornicators or covetous or extortion or all these things that it lists, you know, uh, with, with anyone that falls into these, these categories, you know, we wouldn't be able to go to the grocery store. We wouldn't be able to go talk to the clerk. I mean, because the world is full of all these people. And such were some of us in times past. He goes on and clarifies in verse 11 and says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. And of course, if you know the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's dealing with a man that was, it was said that he, he was actually, uh, you know, fornicating with his, his father's wife. I believe it was his stepmother, okay, or maybe it was a divorced situation. I don't know all the details. What he was saying is you need to put such, you need to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So the Bible's real clear here that there are very specific sins that are listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that if we are found guilty of, that there we are to exercise church discipline to actually be put out of the local church. And, you know, and, and people will say, well, that's really harsh. You know, that's, that seems kind of, you know, and, and it is harsh, and there's a purpose behind it. It's supposed to be harsh. You know? the, we'll see here what, the, what the, uh, the purpose of it all is at the end. But we're kind of wrapping this up, this whole series uh, this morning. You know, we've already talked about these specific sins, uh, such as fornication, covetousness, extortion, idolatry. We've even talked about, uh, you know, uh, so on, uh, being a railer, so on and so forth. But we also, so we're concluding today with the topic of being a drunkard or drunkenness. You know, and this is probably one of the two sins that's listed here that are probably going to be more commonly found in a local church. You say, why are you preaching on this? Is anybody guilty of it? Not that I know of, okay? But here's the thing. When, as a church grows, you can, get, you can mark it down that there's going to be people that are involved in things that you would, you would probably surprise you. You know, the people don't walk into church on Sunday and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and, and we can't just assume that everybody here isn't involved in some kind of sin. There's probably people that are involved in sin, you know, at, at any time. I, that's one thing that, you know, Pastor Anderson has has, has reiterated time and time again to, to those that would preach, is that, look, you need to preach on all manner of sin because I guarantee you there's somebody out there that's involved in it. You know, so we need, because no one's perfect. You know, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. So we need to be able to preach on these things because uh, there just might be that, you know, this sermon could actually maybe bring us back from having to experience this kind of discipline. You know, maybe we're starting to you know, flirt with these sins, you know, and now we're not going to have, you know, the preaching should warn us and, and cause us to take heed and, you know, might, might spare us the, you know, the, the punishment that, that's involved here. Now, people, again, they'll say, well, that seems kind of harsh. That seems kind of, you know, how could you say that? How, you know, God is love, so on and so forth. And there's churches that they wouldn't even touch this passage with a 10-foot pole. And, if, you know, to the critics, I would say, well, you should consider the Old Testament punishment for drunkenness. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Now here's a controversial passage that people like to throw in our face. You know, the people, the critics of the Bible, the critics of Christianity, the atheists, atheists of this world that like to, to say, oh, you know, the Bible teaches that you should kill children. That's what they say. God commanded you, and, they, and this, is what they're, this is what they're referring to. But let's read the context and see what it's really saying here. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, do you know your son will always be your son no matter how old they get? You can't just read son and instantly think child, okay? You know, I'm still somebody's son even though I'm 39 years old today. You know, I didn't stop being a son just because I became an adult. This passage is referring to an adult, and it's very clear when you see this here. 
which will not obey. He says, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. So here you have uh, some parents that are at the end of their rope with, uh, you know, probably a young man. It says in verse 19, they'll chin his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city of his city under the gate of this place and they shall say unto the elders of the city this our son is stubborn and rebellious he will not obey our voice he is a glutton and a drunkard now right there that's how i know it's referring to an adult right. because it's referring to an adult uh, uh, you know a, a glutton and a drunkard you know i'm not i don't suspect that my son corbin john here at any time i'm going to come home and find him tipping back a 40 or something like that <laughs> you know telling me off and and and, and just pouring himself another round of you know jack daniels or whatever at the kitchen table you know being a drunkard is something that's reserved for people who have grown in age they've come to a place where they, they are capable of this type of thing <coughs> now the gluttony part you know maybe i could if i put enough fish sticks in front of him he might just <laughs> the tater tots and things like that he might he might get carried away but you know we'll spare him that okay he's a good boy but uh you know that's why i know this passage is talking about an adult okay and, it, and it's talking about and this is a very severe set of circumstances mom and dad have come to this young man he's a glutton and he's drunkard he's probably you know uh, a strain on the family he's bringing a bad name upon them and reputation you know he's not working he's a bum he won't get a job he won't grow up he won't and they're rebuking him and they're chastening him and it just comes to a point where it's obvious that it's just not going to get through his head he's not going to change so the bible has a prescription you know and before you criticize a church that would say, hey, we got to kick out the drunks. I mean, let's consider the prescription that's, that's given out here in first, or, uh, Deuteronomy. Look at verse 21. And, the men of that, and all the men of that city shall stone him with stones that he die. I mean, God says, let's put the death penalty on this person. And you say, well, that seems really harsh. But what's the purpose behind it? It goes on and says, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. You know, some of the most dangerous individuals in society are single young men. There I said it. <laughs> you know, because they're six feet tall and bulletproof, and they're all about, you know, getting drunk and, and, and driving and, and taking lots of chances and putting other people at risk. Yep. And that's why I believe he's prescribing this here. You got somebody who's a glutton and a drunkard. He's a hazard to society. And probably somebody else is going to suffer at his hands. Right. So they say, put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, uh, we don't ever see them actually carrying this out in Scripture, which might explain why they became, got to the back sudden state that they did, and God had to punish them so severely later on in their history. But, I mean, even if they did, do you think they had to do this very often? I mean, how often would this have to happen in a society for people to start to kind of shape, you know, shape up? Right. I bet all the other gluttons and the other drunkards would probably sober up and start to listen to mom and dad. So this is a deterrent to spare the society from the negative consequences of what? Specifically here, of alcohol. He says he's a glutton and a drunkard, okay? Now, if you would, I should have had to keep something in Proverbs 23 where we were, if you would, and keep something in Proverbs for the rest of the morning. We're going to be there. But go over to Proverbs chapter 23. You know, the Bible has nothing good to say about alcohol. And, we, and this is kind of another sermon to get into about, you know, the, not all wine in the Bible is alcoholic, you know, we could prove that from the Bible. I mean, even in Proverbs 23, where it says, look not upon the wine when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. It's talking about fermentation. You know, and, when, and that's a whole nother, you know, a whole nother sermon. If you have questions about that, we could talk about it later. But what we're talking about today is, is the, the, the fact that being a drunk is something that will get you kicked out of the local church. And why is that? Why does God have such negative consequences, both in the New Testament and Old Testament, for those that would be drunkards? Because nothing good is going to come in your life because of alcohol. Okay? And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get up and glorify, you know, my sin or talk about, you know, get real personal. But I can tell you from my own experience that nothing good has ever come in my life because of alcohol. In fact, some of the most hurtful, painful, long-lasting things that have been a detriment in my life have come because of alcohol. And there's many other people, I'm sure if we went around the room, could testify to the same thing. They could think back about the times they indulged in alcohol and then immediately start to think of all the shameful or the, the hurtful or just bad negative things that came about as a consequence. And that's what the Bible clearly spells out, spells out here in Proverbs 23. Look at verse 29. Who hath woe? 
Okay, and then he just goes on this litany of just negative outcomes. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? He goes on and says, they that tarry long at the wine. Those that are drunkards, the wine bibbers and the drunks of this world. They are the ones that have woe. I mean, we think about woe, just people who are just, you know, bad, terrible things have happened have just made them sad, depressed, just woeful people. They have sorrow. You know, they, they get drunk, they do something they shouldn't, or somebody does something to them, they get themselves in a situation, and all it brings is sorrow upon their life. Uh, you know, the, 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 the dad turns into a drunk and starts, you know, abusing the wife and mistreating his family. That brings sorrow into a person's life. I mean, you don't even have to be the one drinking the alcohol in order for it to bring sorrow into your life. You could just be the, you could be the child of a drunk. You could be married to the drunk. You know, you could be the person who just went, was going about your business and got on the road with the drunk and shared the road with the drunk by no choice of your own and sorrow was brought into your life through the car accident, through all the different things that alcohol brings. Who hath contentions? You know, who has the bar fight? You know, who has the, you know, the, the going out and picking a fight with people? You know, uh, who, who has the guy missing teeth and cracked ribs because he got drunk and got pulled out back and, and beaten? You know, I know people like that, that are missing teeth because they went to a, they went to a bar, got drunk, got, you know, got lippy with the wrong guy or group of guys and just got kicked while he was down out in some alley somewhere. Who has that? Who has all these things? They that tarry long at the wine. The drunkards of this world. Who hath babbling? You know, that's probably the least, uh, you know, um, that's probably the most tolerable consequence of being a drunk or being around a drunk is the babbling, right? I mean, the woe, the sorrow, and the contentions, those are very bad things. But even just the babbling of a drunk is enough to drive a person insane. I mean, drunk people are the most annoying people to be around. There I said it. And the drunker they get, the more obnoxious they are. I mean, that's why when I was, I had a season where I drove for Lyft, you know, the, the ride share. And uh, I did that for a few months. And very quickly, I determined I'm not picking up anybody after 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. Because at 10 p.m., you know, you're, you'll pick up somebody, you know, you start picking up people at the bar and they're a little, they're just a little buzzed. And then you're know, like, okay, I can tolerate that. You know, they still have their wits somewhat about them. At least they have enough good sense to actually call for a ride. But then you start, you know, after that, like every hour that went by, they just got drunker and drunker and drunker. And then by like 12, 1, 2, I mean, you're picking up people that are just talking really loud in your car and having a conversation and just blah, 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 blah. And it's just the whole way to the house or wherever you're taking them. Oh, can you stop here? Can you, you know, just adding stops and just doing that. And I just said, I can't take this. You know, the, the drunks, it's the babbling. You know, being around drunk people, just blah, blah, blah. I and mean, I could talk about other times we've uh, talked about or ran into that. Anybody who know, who's run into drunks, you know, that's why people, if you're going to be around a drunk, you have to get drunk. Right. It's the only way you can toler tolerate being around that nonsense that comes out, just the babbling. <coughs> who hath wounds without cause? You know, people who wake up and they don't even realize, why, why do I have a black eye? How did I, how did I miss these teeth? Uh, oh man, how did I get that cracked rib? Why is my knee twisted? You know, who has wounds without cause? You know, <laughs> they went out and, and got drunk and they can't even remember, you know, uh, what happened to him. I remember, I remember I had a friend who got drunk. He was this close to just throwing, literally just hanging onto a door jam, ready to throw himself down a flight of stairs, just by his fingertips. And I'm like trying to talk him back. I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do this. What are you doing? And he was ready to just throw himself headlong down a, a set of stairs because he was drunk. He lost all good reason. Who hath redness of eyes? You know, and think about the, the, the different, you know, physical attributes that come with being a drunk. You know, the red eyes, the big nose, the beer gut, so on and so forth. All, you know, the, the cirrhosis of the liver, all these damaging things that alcohol does to your body. I mean, I've known more than one person who ha has, you know, was told, look, if you continue to drink, you will die. It will kill you. Your liver is, is shot. You can't continue to drink. And they literally, people, their friends that stood by and watched that person literally within a few months just drink themselves to death. I've known more than one person like that. But is that what the world shows us when they promote alcohol? Is that what they're going to show you on, uh, you know, on, on the television and in the magazine 
and so on and so forth. Is that what the Bacardi commercial is all about? No, they're going to show you a bunch of babes and a bunch of hunks just partying, having a good time. You know, nobody's, you know, no consequences. They're not going to show you the next day. They're not going to show you the hangover, you know, or, or whatever else can happen when people are, are getting themselves intoxicated. That's why he goes on and says in verse 31, look not upon the wine when it is red. He says, don't even look at it. You know, and I've talked about, you know, I'm not going to go at length here on this topic of alcohol. I've preached other sermons about, sermons about it. Because a lot of even Christians today, they'll try to justify drinking alcohol. And to them, I say, okay, well, the, you know, if you want to say you can drink it, the, but the Bible could be clear that you're not even to look at it. He says, don't even look at it. So if you want to drink it, and I've challenged other people to do this, by all means, go to the grocery store. You know, before you walk in, put on a blindfold. Go to the, find your way to the alcohol aisle, right, to the, to the liquor aisle. You know, try to pick out the bottle you want. Remember not to look at it. Get it in your cart. And get it over to the, the cash register. You know, you don't have to worry about getting any the, the weird looks you're going to get because you won't see them because, remember, you're blindfolded, right? Pay for it. Get it home. And then try to pour the alcohol, you know, once you make it home without spilling any. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Look not upon the wine when it is red. Don't even look at it. When it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last it biteth like a, a serpent and stingeth like an adder. You know, it doesn't start out that way. And people get, this is how people get lured into drinking alcohol. They see everybody having a good time. They see everybody, they, they like the feeling and the sensation that comes with it. You know, and if anybody, you know, has never drunk alcohol and wants to know what it's like, you know, just, just go stand somewhere, you know, and spin around in a circle as fast as you can until you're about ready to vomit, you know, and it's a lot like that. You know, it literally, just lay, lay, so just imagine laying down, you know, or, and the world just going, <laughs> it's like self-induced vertigo is basically what it is. But at the last, it says, it biteth uh, like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. I mean, we wouldn't go snake handling, would we? You know, I know this, this isn't that kind of Baptist church, people. <laughs> you know, we're not, gonna, we're not handling snakes here. You know, if I were to take you out into the, into the mountains today and say, hey, let's go find a diamondback rattler and see if we can play with it. You would say, you're crazy. You know, what are you doing? Don't mess with that. But that's what alcohol is. And that's what you're doing when you're, when you're drinking alcohol, when you're getting drunk, when you're indulging, you know, the, the use of alcohol. You're, play, you're, you're playing with a serpent. And it never ends well. People who play with snakes long enough, you know, they get bit, and they get poisoned, they get hurt. And he goes on and says in verse 33, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. You know, and he's not talking about the goth chick or the emo, right? He's talking about women that are not your own, yep. right? You're not your wife. You know, the stranger, the foreigner. That's what he's talking about. You're going to behold women you probably otherwise wouldn't. I mean, how many adulterous uh, relationships have come out of people just getting drunk? Because alcohol takes away your inhibitions. You know, the, the, uh, the proverbial office party. You know, where, you know, the Christmas party at the office where, you know, everyone gets drunk and then somebody's, you know, committing adultery in some room somewhere. You say, that's only the movies. I've heard of it happening. I've known people that have done it. It does happen. People get drunk and they do things they otherwise wouldn't. They get involved in adultery. Uh, when you know they otherwise wouldn't they would probably if they hadn't gotten drunk would have you know kept their integrity remained faithful not cheated on their spouse but because they were playing with this serpent playing with this adder called alcohol they got bit <coughs> he says thine and thine heart shall utter perverse things that reminds me of another lift story in fact it was the last lift ride i gave i said that's it i'm done as when i was giving rides on a friday night down near the University of, uh, uh, of Arizona in Phoenix. Is that where the U, U of, which I get them confused. This is U of A, this is A of U, I don't know. ASU, it's ASU up there, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm back and forth too much, so I get them all mixed up. Anyways, the point being, I'm picking up, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old something, uh, you know, young, I use the word ladies very loosely here, young women, and they're drunk. And I tell you the, the most perverse things I've ever heard. And I've, you know, I've been around a little while, and I've, and I've been around some rough people. I mean, I've worked in, in construction. I've worked with some, some rough necks, some, some rednecks. And they've said, I've heard some crass talk, but I've never heard 
the kind of perverse speaking that came out of the mouth of these young ladies. And I shouldn't even say ladies because they weren't. I mean, it was so bad. The person who ordered the ride, she was all the way in the back. She was the last one out. She said, I'm so sorry. I ordered the ride. These are, these are my friends. They're, they're drunk. I, I apologize. I mean, she was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. And I said, that's it. I can't handle it anymore. And I was done. Now, do you think they'd be saying the kind of things they were saying if they weren't drunk? In front of some complete stranger? Some grown man? Crazy. But that's what'll happen. You know, these are the type of things that happen with alcohol. <coughs> Yea, there shall be he as that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. I mean, that's the perfect illustration of what it's like when you've just drunk in so much alcohol to where the room is spinning, the world is spinning, you can't keep your balance, you can't walk a straight line. That's the picture it's painting there. You know, you're, li you're lying down in the midst of the sea, right? Just, you're just everywhere. Oh, I can't keep my feet underneath me because I've had too much to drink. Maybe I should get behind the wheel of a car and, and drive. Probably not a good idea. He says in verse 35, They have stricken me, and thou shalt say, And I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I wink? I will seek it yet again. And that's probably the worst part of this whole passage. Is despite all these just terrible consequences, the woe, the sorrow, the contentions, the babbling, the wounds, the strange women, the uttering of perverse things is that I'll seek it yet again. Where you actually become what they call today an alcoholic or what the Bible calls a drunk. Somebody who becomes addicted, who just who can't imagine living their life without having alcohol in it. And that's why today, quite frankly, our nation is full of drunks. It is. There's bars on every corner. There's liquor stores on, in, in, every, on every, in every city. And people, you know, being drunk is just, it's, it's, it's socially acceptable in America today. But here's the thing. Society is not my standard. The world does not stand, set the standards for me. This book does. Right here. And this book teaches that we are to be sober. That we are not to be drunks. And in fact, if we are guilty of being a drunk, that we are to be kicked out of the local church. And again, why is it that we kick people out of local church over these specific sins? Not every sin. The ones that are listed in 1 Corinthians 5. Is because it says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, if we let people come in and just be drunks, soon the young people in here are going to see other people being drunks and think, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Oh, it, there's nothing wrong with being a fornicator or an extortioner or an idolater or any of these other, any of these other things. That's why they got to go. And so it, that leaven does not spread and leaven the whole lump. <clears throat> you know, and this, this would apply to any form of, of not being sober. You know, another thing that's really taken off even here in Arizona is, you know, uh, the, the, the dispensaries, right? The pot. Okay, and that's, that's a huge billion-dollar business now. But the, in my mind, my opinion is that is a form of drunkenness. You know, getting stoned on weed is, you know, it might not have the same detrimental effects necessarily as alcohol, but you can't sit there and tell me it doesn't have negative, negative effects. And the Bible commands us to be sober. Be sober. So whether you're drinking alcohol or smoking weed or shooting up heroin or snorting coke or taking pharmaceuticals or whatever, you're not sober. Right. To me, that all falls into the category of not being, uh, of being a drunk. Excuse me. Okay. And you know, on the pot thing, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. And the funniest thing, that, that, that's not really funny, but just the dumbest thing, I guess I, sh I should say, is people will say, you know, well, there's no long-term effects to smoking marijuana. That's the most ridiculous thing. You must be high to, have say, to say that. You know, and I'm not, and I'm speaking from a place, look, I, I grew up with potheads. I know what it's like. And these potheads, you know, they, they could, the, the, the effects that it has on your mind is staggering. The short-term memory loss is a real thing. I mean, I knew one pothead, the guy could not, literally, could not leave the house without having to turn around and come back for his phone, his wallet, his sunglasses, something. I mean, just after a lifetime of smoking weed, getting high, like he'd leave, I, I, one summer he lost three phones. In one summer, he lost three cell phones. Just forgot where he put it. Couldn't remember. And I even remember, uh, you know, my mom, she was trying to scare us straight. You know, she took us to this, this seminar on weed at the hospital. And the doctors, where they got up and they explained what THC actually does to your, your brain cell. Because THC clings to fat. And you, every one of your cells is surrounded by fat. And uh, including your brain cells. Okay? So the, the, the chemical in pot, you know, I don't, I'm not a 
a chemist up here, I don't know all the technical you know, terminology, but the gist of it is this, that your brain cells have these nice, they have what's called brain synapses, and those are the things that fire from one brain cell to another and help you think, and, and you know, your, that's what helps with your cognitive processes, is the firing of these brain synapses from one cell to another. And in a normal human brain cell, these synapses are lined up very nice and orderly, and they shoot out very easily. But when people start to smoke weed, it actually, the fat clings to that cell, and it disrupts those brain synapses, and you look at it under a microscope, and they're just all jumbled up. They're not nice, and they're, they're tangled with one another, and they have a harder time firing out. That's why, you know, whenever we talk, you know, uh, if we're out soul winning, or if we've been around people that are high, You'll be talking to them and you'll, you'll ask them a question. You can just see it like slowly processing that you even ask them. Like they're just not even there sometimes. But that's, again, that's a whole other sermon. The point being, the, the point of the sermon tonight, or this morning rather, is that we are not to be drunks. That the Bible commands us to be sober people. And it's not because God's just trying to, you know, God's a downer. You know, God's just trying to bring you down. God's just trying to cramp your style. It's because these things have negative consequences that affect people's lives permanently. And, you know, the, the world wants to cast this spell on everybody and make everything, everybody think that, you know, there's no consequences for, for partaking in these things, but there is. <coughs> now, if you're there in Proverbs 23, look at verse 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall re uh, rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Let not thine heart envy sinners. You know, that's probably where a lot of people start when they be, uh, about, uh, start to, uh, how they become a drug addict or a drunk is they envy sinners. They say, oh, it seems like they're having a good time. Boy, they're having fun. Why can't I do that? Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness will close a man with rags. I mean, we see that all around. The drunkards that are, and the gluttons that are come to poverty, and that have been clothed with rags. Have you ever stepped, I mean, I remember I used to walk to work, you know, and I'd have to, every day, almost practically, I'd have to walk around this guy who was just laying in his own vomit, laying in his own piss, because he just had gotten so drunk that he couldn't even pick himself up off the ground anymore. And everybody in the neighborhood knew who he was. And eventually that guy, and they, they, it was like, he, I noticed for a few days, I'm like, man, this guy's gone. Maybe he sobered up. And then I found out later, no, he died. Yeah. Finally just drank himself to death. <coughs> this, is, this is where it leads. Maybe not everybody, but do we really want to roll the dice? Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. The Bible has nothing good to say about alcohol. There's, no, there's not one positive mention of it. Everything it says is negative. It casts it in the worst light possible. Proverbs chapter 31, look at verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. So he's saying, look, don't give your ways, uh, your strength to women. And he's talking about don't be a whoremonger. Don't be an adult. He's not saying don't get married, okay? Because notice there it says women, right. right? It's okay to give your strength to a woman in marriage, okay? I gotta clarify that because I've, I've heard people get this, mis you know, I'm just gonna be like Paul and stay single for my whole life because I'm not gonna give my strength to women. It's like, you don't understand what that verse is talking about, apparently. It's, anyway, that's a side note. But she's saying, look, don't give, your, don't give yourself, don't be given to those things which destroy kings. Now, kings are mighty men. Kings are men that have great power and strength and ability. They're nobility. They're, they, they, you know, they have, uh, they're not somebody that's taken down easily. But there are things the Bible's saying that will destroy them. And what is it that they list? Well, one is women, right? The, the whoremongering. But it says, you know, and Solomon's a perfect example of that, King Solomon. But verse 4, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert judgment of any, uh, of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. 
and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And you say, well, that's for kings. We're not kings. But what does Revelation chapter 1 say? Yep. It, you know, when John wrote to the churches, he said that uh, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten from the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests right. unto God and his father. So if you're saved, you're born again, guess what? You are a king. You are a priest. You are nobility this morning. And alcohol is not for you, the Bible says. It is not for kings. Now, let me just clarify something on, on, on what we're talking about this morning. Because we're talking about, again, sins that will get you kicked out of church. And drunkenness is one of them, right? Now, I believe that 1 Corinthians 5, where the drunkenness it's talking about there, it, it, it's being reserved for a certain level of being a drunk. Okay? Not everybody that, I will say this, you know, not everybody that, you know, is drinking alcohol is necessarily a drunk. Now, they're on their way to being a drunk, okay? <coughs> now, if you would, it, it, go over to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I want to show us this, okay? Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but often when we were reading the scriptures this morning, you saw glutton and drunk in the same breath. You know, gluttony and drunkenness. Gluttony and drunkenness. <coughs> he is a glutton and a drunkard, right? <coughs> and even, they, you know, when they falsely accuse Jesus in Luke chapter 7, look there, it says in verse 34, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. So, what it's talking about being, when you're being a drunk is when you're drinking alcohol to excess. Okay, where you're just, you, there's a certain point where you reach where you're not just drinking alcohol, but you are a drunk, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not condoning alcohol at all. But we don't want this, to, you, what we don't want to happen when you preach on these type of things is for people to, you know, start insisting, you know, that we throw people out because, you know, they were over at their house and they noticed that there was an empty beer can in the trash can or something. You know, they don't come to church drunk. They hold down a job. You know, you wouldn't know they even drank, okay? But we see some kind of evidence that maybe they drink and all of a sudden it's like we got to kick them out. No, okay? That's, I, and I'm trying to temper that. We don't want to get carried away with this, all right? You know, if somebody's, you know, so the question then becomes, well, what's the test of whether or not somebody's actually a drunk? And this is a gray area. You don't have to agree with me on this, okay? But, you know, we, I have to think about this because, you know, the church is the one that would have to enforce, enforce this. And, you know, Pastor Anderson, you know, he's, he has his standards, and I agree with these, that these are the test of being a drunk. Okay, when do you, when do you cross the line from being somebody who, again, who drinks alcohol, which, again, the Bible condemns and is a sin that needs to be repented of, period, okay? Yeah. But you cross the line where it's not just you're drinking to now where you were actually a drunk, okay? Here's one test. How about you drink often or on a regular basis? You know, if you're drinking every day, you're drunk. If you cannot, if you cannot go throughout through a day without getting dr without drinking, you're a drunk. That's that's my opinion. <coughs> if you can't have a good time without drinking alcohol, you know you're you're a drunk or you're boring, or both. Okay. Uh, drinking. How about you drink less often? Maybe I don't drink every day, but every time I drink, I drink to an extreme degree. Every time I drink, I'm just getting completely. I'm blacking out drunk. No, I don't drink every day. In fact, I don't even drink one. I don't even drink every week. You know, but when I drink, I drink. You know, that's you're a drunk. If you're if you're getting drunk to the place where you can't even remember what happened, you're completely blacking out. That is a sign of being a drunk. How about this? When you're mixing drugs with alcohol. When you're saying, "Well, I'm only drinking a six-pack, but I'm also downing some pills to help amplify the effects." That's drunkenness. <coughs> So those are some tests for being a drunk, you know, and, and people could have different, they could have different opinions about that. They could say, hey, you know, if you, you know, if you are drinking at all, you know, they might consider that drunkenness. I disagree with that, but I think these are some good tests to, to say, are you, have you reached the point where you probably deserve to be kicked out of church? Now I'll say this, you might not be there. You might say, well, you know, I got a six pack at home. You know, I might, I have a beer after work occasionally, but you know, I'm not getting drunk, but you know what? You're on your way. I mean, who's more susceptible to actually becoming a drunk, the guy who's drinking or the guy who's not touching a drop? 
It's the guy who's already building up a tolerance, is already letting it creep in a little bit. So <coughs> we don't want to underestimate the severity of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay? And some people, they'll say, you know what? If I get kicked out of church for being a drunk, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't matter to me. And I'm really, I just kind of want to wrap up this whole series here on this thought. Because okay? we've talked about a lot of things that will get people kicked out of church. And some people can take church or they can leave it. It's not that big a deal to them. But what a lot of people fail to realize is that, you know, being kicked out of church for the Christian is a very severe punishment. I mean, we've all kind of experienced what it's like to not have church on a regular basis with this whole COVID thing. And that wasn't even the result of our sin or anything like that. That was just because of, we know the story behind that. But it should have probably, everybody who's come back from that, you know, it is probably more grateful to have church. I mean, I know I am. I missed it. So if we're the type of person who's just saying, well, you know what, if I get kicked out of church for being drunk, whatever, it's not that big a deal. You're underestimating the severity of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're there, if you would turn back, if, if you're not there. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, <clears throat> that when you're getting kicked out of church, you're delivering such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I mean, I got some criticism online for me entitling the series, Get Right or Get Out. You know, some snowflake had to respond and say, oh, that's such a mean thing to say. Well, what about what Paul said? Right. What if I entitled the series, uh, How to Get Delivered Unto Satan for the Destruction of the Flesh? Right. <laughs> I mean, that's way harsher than anything I said. And it's right. But, and that's what's going on when you are being kicked out of church. You're being delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of, our, of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 12. For what have I to do judge them that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But God, uh, but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from yourselves, among yourselves, that wicked person. It says, them that are without, God judgeth. You know, we judgeth within. But when a person is put out, God takes over. So people get kicked out of church and they think, oh, that's the, my chastisement's over. I can go about my sin now. Uh, free and clear, no guilty conscience, no one's going to come down on me. I'm not going to have to go to church and hear the preaching about it. I'm not going to have to get convicted about it. No one's going to confront me about sin in my life. And everything's just going to, it's just going to be a cakewalk from here out. No. When you're kicked out, now it's God that's going to judge. The severity of 1 Corinthians 5 is, a, is, is real, and people underestimate it. When we're kicked out of church, you are put under the curse of God. That's what it's saying here. I mean, let's read it again. He says in verse 12, What have I to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. And we are putting, when the person who is kicked out is the person who is without. They're without the church. They're outside of it. And that's where God takes over. And God starts to judge. So we can't just get this idea, well, I'll just get backslid and I'll get into some sin. And if I get kicked out, so what? Dude, man, that's the beginning of your problems. Your problems have only just begun when the church has had to exercise discipline like this. And again, it's not every sin. That the church, you know, there's certain sins that aren't going to get you kicked out, but there are very specific ones that will. <coughs> but what is the purpose behind all of it? I mean, what was the purpose behind this series, even preaching through this? Why is 1 Corinthians 5 even in the Bible? Why would, why would a church, why does Paul insist that a church would kick people out? Well, we know one is, is so those sins won't, won't spread within a church because those sins are so detrimental okay, to a person and to individuals and to the church. But the purpose behind church discipline is to restore people, right. is that they would repent and get right. And that's the thing that nobody ever sees in a church. And, you know, people, all people hear the preacher get up and talk about how we'll kick you out of church if you're guilty of this. But what they often don't see is the person that gets kicked out, gets right, and comes back. Because the preacher doesn't get up and say, oh, so-and-so's back. Hey, so-and-so quit being a drunk and a fornicator. Let's all give him a round of applause. We're glad you quit. You know, we don't do that. It's embarrassing. Right? We forgive and, and we forget. We don't mention their sins under them again. And we just let them come back in and, and act like it never happened and just move forward with our lives. And I've seen that happen. People say, Let's do this. How, do you even, how could you even build a church like this? But I've seen it happen. I've seen people on more than one occasion get kicked out of church and then go out for a little while and realize the mistake that they made and get right and repent and come back and be restored and 
There's probably people I'm even forgetting about that that's happened. That, and, 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 and that's the purpose behind it all of it, is to restore that person. <coughs> and that's the attitude we have to have. You know, it, we, we, we're, not, we're not here to just go on a witch hunt in the local church and say, who are we going to kick out today? Who's got it coming? You know, I, I'm suspecting so-and-so. You know, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And we're going to pull out our magnifying glass and put on the detective hat and start to you know, root around in somebody's business and see if we can't get them kicked out. That's not what we're doing. Okay? And even when it comes to the point where we have to deal with somebody like this, you know, it should be done with a very specific attitude. Not one that's like, oh, I knew it. Oh, he's had it coming. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're coming down hard. I mean, we have to take a strong stand. But the Bible says in Galatians 6, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, the whole purpose of kicking somebody out is so that they'll get right and come back. And you know what the great example, we have a great example of that in 1 Corinthians. I mean, they, he's saying, kick this guy out, deliver him unto Satan, this guy that was, you know, sleeping around with his father's wife. You know, committing such sins as no, wasn't even so much as named among the Gentiles, Paul said. He said, look, the world isn't even as bad as this guy. Get him out of there. <coughs> But well, we, we, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where that guy is restored. You know, we find out later that you know, he did get kicked out and that he repented. He was made sorry and that he repented and he got right with God. Look at verse 1. He said, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I, write, I wrote unto you with many tears. He's talking about the previous epistle, 1 Corinthians. He said, look, it, it pained me to write this. It was, I, was, I knew what I was writing was going to make you sorry. And 1 Corinthians, that book is just one long, scathing rebuke. And that's a hard book. If you, that's, not the, you know, that's not the book to the Galatians or the Ephesians. I mean, 1 Corinthians, that's a... That's not the type of letter you want to get from your pastor. I mean, it's just like one just long list of what's wrong with you. Fix this. Fix that. Get this right. Get that right. Stop doing this. Start doing this. Right? And he's saying, look, when I wrote that in verse 4, uh, he wrote it with much afflic affliction and anguish of, I, of heart. I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Like he's saying, look, the reason I did all that is because I love you. You know, I don't want you to, to, to suffer the consequences of these sins. He does, you know, that's the purpose behind church discipline. Any one of these sins that we've talked about over the last few weeks, you know, any time, any, uh, that, that would get a person kicked out of church, the purpose behind church discipline is so that that person would get right. Not so that we can just, you know, feel superior or something like that. Right. That's not it at all. And here's the thing. Any one of us could fall into the, any one of these sins. Any one of us could fall prey to this if we're not careful, right? He says in uh, verse 5, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved us, but in part, that I might not overcharge you all. Verse 6, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. What is he saying? He said, look, you did what I told you to do, and that's enough. He said, sufficient to such a man is this punishment. You know, you don't need to add insult to injury. And here's the thing, if people, and I've never seen this, and I pray that we never will, and if we ever have to kick somebody out of church, you know, that's not, that, does, that does not leave, uh, it does not suddenly become open season upon that individual. Where now it's like, oh, now I could just go to Facebook and, and, and just, you know, go on social media and just rip them a new one. Right. You know, the punishment of being kicked out is sufficient enough. The public shame that already comes with that without us having to go on there and just, oh, let's just have a dog pile now. Let me call him up and give him a piece of my mind, too, while we're at it. That's not, that's an, that's not appropriate. He said, look, the sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. Again, because when you're being kicked out of the church, it's not just the preacher that's kicking you out. It's the church body. And then the church, they are, they all, because again, this is the authority. You know, and, and the preacher is just the mouthpiece of this authority. And we all agree that this is the authority, or at least we should. 
And we're all inflicting that punishment as a body upon that individual with this as our authority. Okay? So he says in verse 7, So that contrary wise, you ought to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. What is he talking about? Look, when a person gets right and, you, and comes back to church and gets, and, and, and gets that sin out of their life, you know, you ought to forgive him and comfort him. Lest he should be so over, uh, swallowed up with over much sorrow. You know, there's probably people out there that have gotten kicked out of church and they want to come back and they've even gotten the sin out of their life, but they're just too afraid the way they'll be treated when they come back. They're, not, they're unsure. Well, if I come back and show my face, what's going to happen? Everybody knows, you know, or a certain amount of people are, you know, got out that I was involved in this and I've been kicked out of church. You know, they should become, people, people should be able to come back and be comforted as if nothing even happened, you know. And that's, that's one area some people, I mean, we really like the part about, oh, let's kick them out, let's kick them out, right? And then they get right and come back. And a lot of people I've seen, that's a harder pill for them to swallow. It's like, oh, you, you know, you kicked them out, they did their part, they got right, now it's your turn to do your part and forgive them and comfort them. Lest they should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. <coughs> Look at verse 8. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Now I'm not saying you have to buy this person a box of chocolates and, and write them a Hallmark card or something like that. But can you shake their hand and say, hey, it's good to see you? you say, hey, I'm glad you're back. Hey, I missed you. Hey, it's good to have you here. You know, if a person comes back and is repentant and, and wants to do right and, 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 and live for the Lord and be a part of the local body, and, you know, we should welcome that person back with open arms. And I've seen people struggle with that part of it. I mean, they got the first part of that equation down. Oh, they're guilty of that sin? Yeah, they got to go. Yeah, they're out of here. And then they, that person gets right, you know, however much later, and they come back and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, what are they doing here? That's the wrong attitude to have. You know, they got right. Your job now is to forgive them, to comfort them, to assure them that they're welcome back. Okay? And he says in verse 9, to, For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be about obedient in all things. Look, not just the part, the part about kicking people out, but the part about welcoming them back in, obedient in all things that Paul wrote. <coughs> to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. And look at this in verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, verse 11, you know, I, we quote that often. We'll say, well, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And we're not even talking about anything that's related to 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2. But in the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, what is the device of Satan that he uses? It's unforgiveness. That's what it's referring to here. He's saying, look, you need to forgive them. He says, for, for your sakes, I forgave it in the person of Christ. Look, I forgave, you forgive. Why? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Lest Satan gets a foothold in our hearts and in our minds and our attitudes. Lest our minds are evil affected towards the brethren. And a spirit of disunity comes within the church. He says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know that's how Satan works. That's one of the devil's many devices that he uses in people's lives. I mean, we often think about, you know, the sins and the temptations that he brings in, but sometimes we forget about the attitudes he tries to breed in us. The thoughts he brings into our heads, right? Or tries to make us feel a certain way. And one of those things that he makes it try to make us feel, or, or one, of, uh, one of the attitudes he tries to instill in people is that of unforgiveness. People who are unwilling to just forgive and forget. That's the context of 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2. That's how I read it. And that is an attribute of the devil, someone who is not willing to forgive. <clears throat> and that's not a godly attitude. The Bible says, if you would, go over to Psalms 103. We're going to wrap it up in Psalms, but go to Psalms 103. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, But if the wicked will turn from his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, shall, uh, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and that, that he should return from his ways and live? That's, that's God's attitude. Look, I want to forgive. I want them to do right and come back. And I don't even want to mention their past transgressions to him. 
That's an attitude and a spirit of forgiveness that God has towards us. <clears throat> you know, and we should not desire to see people be punished beyond measure. Like, oh, they got kicked out of church. You know, they should never be welcome back. I don't care if they repent and get right. And, you know, I, I, you know the church might welcome them back, but I'm not going to. That's a, that's a demonic attitude, quite frankly. That's a device of, of Satan that he uses. <clears throat> Because the devil, he doesn't forgive, and the devil doesn't forget either. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice uh, saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. He's saying the devil, you know, he's being cast out in heaven finally. But while he's there, one of the things the devil does is just accuse the brethren day and night. He's constantly accusing. He's not forgetting. Even things that God has forgiven. I mean, God, you know, has separated us as, uh, from our sins as far as the east is from the west. Yep. And it's in the sea of God's forgetfulness. But the devil just keeps trying to bring these things back up. And just constantly accuse the brethren. That's, that's a demonic attitude. It, you know, we, that's not an attitude we should have. We don't want to be unforgiving and we, don't, and we want to be forgetful. When people repent and get right, we need to forgive them. And here's the thing, you've not really forgiven somebody if you can't forget. Right. You say, oh, I forgive you, but in the back of your mind, you just, you're just constantly bringing it up, mm -hmm. constantly imagining how you're going to tell them off or what the things you'd save. You know what I mean? Right. That's not forgetting. That's not forgiveness. Yep. And the people that, you know, uh, uh, for, that truly forgive are those that com that completely forget. They don't even remember. You know, you, you come back up to them later. Hey, you know, I know I said I'm sorry once, but man, it just it still bothered me. I, I just want you to know I'm really sorry. They're like, what are you talking about? Oh, that? Oh man, I didn't even think about that. <coughs> I've totally forgotten. But what are you even talking about? We should forgive and forget. Look at Psalms 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. I mean, God gets mad. We know that. You know, God gets angry. God chastens. God disciplines. God, you know, has rules. And when they're broken, there's consequences. But he's not angry forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. You know, we should show pity to people. Yep. When people are truly sorry, when they've, you know, when, they, when they've apologized, that's the time to have pity and to forgive and to be godlike, not like the devil. In verse 14, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Look, none of us is above committing the sins of 1 Corinthians 5. It, it's, it's, you know, every, the, the Bible says it, in 1 Corinthians 10, I should have to stay there, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such as common to man, but God is faithful who will, with the tempt, uh, who, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Look, those, those sins in 1 Corinthians 5, any one of us could fall prey to that. So we ought to be real careful about our attitude towards others. When other people get involved in sins that, that we, maybe we're not involved in, I'm not saying we should tolerate it. I'm not saying we should tell them it's okay. We should rebuke them. But we should not have an attitude of unforgiveness. We should not have an attitude that doesn't pity them and want them to just get right. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, the Bible says. <clears throat> So we should be careful how we conduct ourselves towards those that are being punished. You know, if somebody, and we pray it never happens, but, you know, the reality is that this church grow, gets big enough and goes on long enough, which I fully anticipate it will, somebody's going to get kicked out eventually. <laughs> it's going to happen because we're, we're sinners. You know, it's, it's going to happen, you know. But here's the thing. This sermon is, is one, serving as a warning, and two, also reminding those of us that might not be guilty of those sins, maybe that'll never happen to us, we should be careful how we conduct ourselves towards those that are being punished. We should be, be, you know, consider ourselves, lest we also be tempted. Are you still in Psalms? 
Look at verse 18, or chapter 18. Last place, I promise. Psalms 18, verse 25. This verse was quoted to me early on in my Christian life, and I've, and I've tried my best to remember it and live it. It says in verse 25, With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the forward, thou wilt show thyself pure, forward. When we, go, when we consider how we're going to treat somebody, we should probably think about how we want God to treat us. And if, and if we're going to be a person who's not going to show mercy and not show pity and not show forgiveness, don't be surprised if God does the same towards us. When we find ourselves in a place of mercy and forgiveness and pity, God might show himself forward because that's what we were. Again, I'm not advocating you know, uh, that we have a slack attitude towards these sins by leadership. You know, that the, that the churches should just ignore 1 Corinthians 5. Because the thing is, those sins that are listed there come with grave consequences for the individual that are guilty of them. And the purpose is that they would be, you know, they would get them out and spare themselves the suffering that comes with it. I'm not at, so again, I'm not advocating a slack attitude, but I'm advocating a spirit of meekness in the body. You know, we don't want to see these things happen. <clears throat> you know, we might not be guilty of any of these sins today, and we pray that we never will, but Maybe we're on the path to becoming guilty of it. I, I mean, we don't know. We, I, you know, we don't, I'm not following around. I'm not calling people and checking up on you or no one's doing that to each other. You know, we just assume the best that everyone's living right and doing the right thing. But it very well may be that, you know, there's something that we've gone over the last few weeks that we might not be guilty of that, but we're on our way there. You know, maybe we're not a drunk today, but there's probably, maybe there's a bottle or two we need just to go home and, and pour out. Or, or maybe there's just you know, a place we need to quit frequenting. We may be on the path. So again, you know, and I, and, and I hope this series was beneficial. You know, I, I, I think it was important to go over it just kind of as, as a preventative maintenance type of thing. And, and, and I don't want it to be perceived as you know, some kind of chest thumping. You know, this, isn't, this isn't me kind of trying to get up and say, hey, you better recognize the authority of the church. And, you know, that's not what this is. What this series has been is you know, a fair warning. It's a fair warning of, of a biblical teaching that, quite frankly, has gone out of style in a lot of churches, which explains why they're overrun with sin. Yep. And, you know, and, and, the, and the warning is that, hey, we need to get right or we need to get out. And let's go ahead and pray.